Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Huggard coming to you from Studio 2014 with another Watchmen video broadcast. This is part three, one, two, three of our series on the falling. What are we talking about? This is based upon 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, if we look at verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day is he talking about? He mentions, see we always walk circumspectly. Circum is a circle. Spectacles is what I have on, hanging on my nose. We look around. We, in life, we, we look around us. See what's going on around us, all right? It's not that we're suspicious or anything or paranoid, but I think we should know where our enemies are. And the Bible teaches us, I think, when we study the Bible, we should walk circumspectly. I think if we look at a verse, I think we ought to look around that verse to see what's going on there. He mentions that day shall not come. What day is that? He mentions specifically the day of Christ, and right Above that, he talks about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. We know that that's going to happen one day. The day of Christ is at hand. It's, I think it's coming soon. And I think that I, the Bible teaches us that Christ is going to appear in the clouds. We're going to be gathered together unto him. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And I am looking forward to Boy, am I ever looking forward to that day. That day is a day of transformation for me and for those of you who trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That day is a day the Bible talks about we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. So I believe that the day that you and I, the day of Christ, the day that you and I are gathered together unto him, and meet the Lord in the air, that day is a day of change for us. We're going to be translated from this world and from this body blah, to a new and wonderful body. A new, a new um, uh, the Bible teaches us that we shall know even as we are known. So we are going to be taken from this mortal world and made immortal. I'm looking forward to that day. That day shall not come except there come a falling away, numero uno, first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Let me tell you what I think. I think that that day that the falling takes place, I think those who fall have also been fundamentally transformed, changed, altered. We're going to go from this series to a series on the singularity, putting together the information right now. Think of my insurance agent and I were talking yesterday about the changes that are taking place very rapidly. Things that insurance companies are meeting to discuss that they're scratching their heads going, we don't know how in the world we're going to keep up with this. One of the things they were talking about was the uh, thing of cars that drive themselves. The insurance company that uh, I pay premiums to every year, they are questioning what's going to happen when cars start driving themselves. Who's going to be liable for it? Who's responsible for it? That's things insurance companies worry about because, you know, they've got to pay the bills. But I think there is coming, and I'm going to deal with this in the singularity, I think there's coming a day that is going to fundamentally change everything in this world. Literally everything in this world. And I think the falling has everything to do with that change or that transformation. Here's, here's how I see, this is what I see in the scriptures. I believe that my change and my transformation, 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 my ch I'm going to transfer from this nation to that one. I believe that my change, my translation from here to there, will not take place until that falling away comes first and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. This is what the Bible says, and I have to believe exactly what this says. So, we've been looking at things 
that are falling, things that uh, we've been looking in the heavenly realm for things that have fallen. Lucifer has fallen. Other angels are going to fall one of these days. The, the false prophet is going to have the ability to make fire come down from heaven or fall from heaven. Everything about this new world order, both the beast, the false prophet, the political systems, the religious systems therein, all of them are fallen systems and every one of them will fall. I believe that this day, as I said before, I believe that this day is a fundamental transformation of everything here on this earth. And here's how I think you should be minded. I think this is how the believer in Jesus Christ and the believer in the Bible, you might want to just lay aside all of your preconceived notions about how you were told everything was going to happen. Because there are some people who say, oh no, we're going we're to be taken to heaven first. That's the first thing that's going to happen. And then all this other stuff happens. Some of them believe it so much that they will take verse 3 and they'll reword it. They'll retranslate it because they don't like what it says. What it says is that there's a coming falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. They said the falling away, the Bible says the falling away comes first. They say, nope, can't happen that way because the charts would be all wrong then. And the charts can't be wrong because we've been teaching the charts now for 40 years. So maybe, maybe in the original Greek, yeah, in the original Greek, maybe we can reword it to say the catching away comes first. Yeah, that's how we'll do it. We'll say the catching away comes first. That way, we're right. And if you think I'm making that up, get yourself a copy of the Swagger Expository King James Bible with all the notes written by Jimmy and Donnie Swaggart, and you look at this verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, because it specifically says, and I know I've mentioned this before, it specifically says, now, a better, this is a poor translation. The King James is a poor translation. Then why are you using it? Copyright. Re what it really should say is that the catching away takes place first. See, now we're right. Now, 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 the, now we've established that we, in fact, were right all along, and the King James translators and the King James Bible was wrong in teaching you that. Sorry, can't do that. I can't do that. I don't have permission, and I believe exactly what this thing says. And I think there are some people who are setting themselves up for a fall. Because what's going to happen, let, let's say that this verse is right in what it says. What's going to happen to all those who have assumed that the catching away, the rapture, happens first and it doesn't? What happens? What happens to them? You pray. You pray. You ask God, God, is Mike Hoggart an idiot? Well... It's a pretty good chance I could be. But what does the Bible say here? And that's what we've been trying to look at. Things, things that fall. And what, what is this falling? And uh, what does it encompass? What does it entail? It says falling away first. But it doesn't. the Bible's not isolated to this one little bitty piece of verse here. We've been looking at all through the scriptures on things that fall. And we, like I said before, we've been looking at fallen angels, uh, fallen Lucifer, things like that. We're going to kind of pick up where we left off last week. And we're actually going to look at probably the most famous falling that has ever taken place in the Bible. If you ask anybody uh, to give you a Bible story, some story out of Bible, out of the Bible, they may say Noah, they may say Moses in the Red Sea, or they may say David and Goliath. What happened to poor old Goliath when David stuck a stone in his forehead, right, right, where the, right where the mark of the beast goes, right where the pineal gland is? What happened to him? Let's look at the scriptures. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. I like this. I, I like it. 
because I know who Goliath represents. He's a lion and a bear. That's what David said. That's what the beast is in Revelation 13. He's six cubits tall. His giants have six fingers. He's got sixes all over him. So I, I understand the typology of Goliath here. And who does he represent? He represents the man of sin, the son of perdition mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2. Notice the stone goes flying through the air. Think of Daniel chapter 2 when, when Nebuchadnezzar sees the four kingdoms. He sees then this stone cut out without hands flying through the air and it hits the, uh, the, uh, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, and what happened to the image? It fell. It could no longer stand. What happens to Goliath? He falls. He can no longer stand. God took away his ability by way of David. He took away his ability to stand until he falls on his face to the earth. Now, here's another connection. For Revelation chapter 17 with the beast of Revelation 13, John is actually kind of explaining the mystery of this beast, of the woman that rides on him, and he explains it this way, Revelation 17, 9, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. Notice this, five are fallen. And one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now, here's, here's something that's interesting, is that here we have the number five. We have five kings that are fallen. Think of Joshua chapter 10. You have five kings that were put in a cave, then they're brought out of the cave, and then what happens to them? They're fallen. And Joshua's captains put their feet on their necks. That's dominion over them. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Jesus must rule until he's put all of his enemies under his feet. Last enemy shall be destroyed his death. So here's the five kings and they're fallen. And they smite them. And they hang them on five trees until the going down of the sun. And then when the sun went down, they cut them down off of the trees and throw them back into that cave where they were. And they rolled great stones upon them. So there's a picture of the five kings fallen. Interestingly, when David picked up a stone to sling it at Goliath, he didn't just pick up one stone. He picked up five. Look at Revelation chapter 9. When the fifth trumpet sounds, then a star falls from heaven. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. When you go back to Joshua chapter 10, you see those, those five kings in a pit. They're in a cave, and they're locked in there. So what happens in verse 22 of Joshua chapter 10? Go read it. The number 22 is the number for revelation. Something's revealed. So they remove the stones. Now the kings come out. Five kings. Fifth angel sounds. Star falls from heaven. Key to the bottomless pit opens it up. What comes out? Those locusts. That locust, Joel's army that Todd Bentley is going to be a part of. Get it? And how long do they hurt man? Five months. There's a connection here. Because let me give you this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. And I want you to notice that. I'd like this. I like this. I want you to notice that when the world falls, we rise. Isn't that beautiful? It's associated with this, with this same number, the number five. Think of as it was in the days of Noah, when the waters prevailed for 150 days. That's five months. There it is again. As Noah and his family is going up, because the waters are rising, what's happening to the rest of the world? They're falling down. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to let God do it however he wants it, but I think he's told us in the Bible how it is. But anyway, getting back to this beast. This beast that comes, he is the eighth. We dealt with that King James Code uh, on the number eight. Go watch that. He is the eighth, but he is of the seven. And of those seven, five of them are fallen. 
this beast, this Antichrist, this man of sin, this son of perdition, represents the falling away because he is of the fallen. Now we're going to look at something interesting, something I, I saw in the book of Acts several years ago. The book of Acts uh, deals with the, um, uh, the beginning of the church, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter and John preaching persecution that comes as a result of it, God calling Saul the Benjamite uh, who's on his way to kill all the Christians because he'd been reading all of the Torah and he hates Jesus, he hates the gospel, so he's going to go kill all the Christians. He's on the road to Damascus, and Jesus himself appears to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So God delivers Saul from the bondage that he was in and gives him, gives him a free heart, calls him to be an apostle. The apostle Paul's preaching everywhere. He's preaching the gospel, and there's two groups in the Bible that hate Paul's guts. They hate his gospel. They hate him for preaching it. One group was the Jews. And to this day, they hate the gospel of free grace. They hate it. They can't stand it. They, and they fight against it. No doubt in my mind about it. Number two, a group that hates Paul's preaching are the people who work for Mystery Babylon, who make, who build temples, who make idols and images and things like that because they hate Paul. Because Paul says, God dwells in temples not made with hands. And so that's not the real God. The real God is free. You can worship him anywhere. And the people of Ephesus are going, well, that's an abomination to us because of our great temple uh, to the goddess Diana. And you know how much money we make from these idols, from worshiping these uh, idols. And I'm telling you that every religion in the world, other than Bible Christianity, has an idol worship attached to it somehow, some way. Let me show you this in the book of Acts chapter 19. Because there was something that they claimed fell from heaven and they worshipped it. Acts chapter 19 verse 35. When the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, You men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana and of the, here it is, the image of which fell down from Jupiter. Did you catch that? Jupiter is Jove. When you hear that phrase, by Jove, that's who that is. It's Jupiter. Jupiter is one of the, one of the chief gods. And apparently, now I don't know this for sure, because I just believe the Bible. There was an image that fell down from Jupiter. You could probably think that maybe like um, a, a meteorite fell from the sky to the earth. We know that my wife and I were going home Sunday night. We were almost home and all of a sudden, phew, there it was in front of us. It was this meteorite and the tail of this thing and sparks shooting out everywhere. We saw it for maybe... I don't know, all of three seconds, and we were just going, that was the coolest thing in the world. It could very well be what happened was this big giant space rock fell to the earth, gravity pulled it in, the uh, earth's atmosphere and the friction heated it up, and here, so you have this big blaze coming down, people are seeing it, and all of a sudden this big giant something another fell to the earth. They called it an image in the scriptures. It may be that just the wear of the friction of the atmosphere maybe had, maybe had uh, shaped it into some figure that resembled. You know how people are? Some lady puts a, a tortilla on the grill and she leaves it on there a little too long. She picks it up and she swears she sees the image of Jesus on the tortilla. I'm not making this up, by the way. So she sets up a shrine and is charging people money to come see Jesus the tortilla God. You can't make this stuff up. So maybe this thing was in the image of some likeness of something and they took it and they went, oh, this is a God that come down to us and we're going to worship it. Or it's possible that maybe someone who found it did a little carving on it and said, this is the image that fell down from Jupiter and they put it up 
somewhere in the temple and they worship it. But they think it's from Jupiter. They think it's from this satanic devil god that they worship. And they're not about to give up their worship. Listen to this now. They're not about to give up their worship of a fallen star. Not for anything are they going to give that up. There's a religion in this world right now these people are so hard-hearted, so demon-possessed, so infatuated with a star that fell down from heaven that they worship. And for the most part, you can't talk them out of it. And the scary thing is, they are slowly but surely taking over the entire world. I'm talking about the religion of Islam. Islam is a satanic, devil-infested religion. Those who practice Islam um, are full of devils. And over the last, I don't know, 13 years since 9-11, and if you want to go back to uh, other bombings that have taken place in Kenya. Our own naval ships have been attacked. The first bombing on the World Trade Tower back in the early 90s. You want to go back to then? We've been dealing with a religious force, Islam, that has done nothing but show itself that they are militant, they are bent on taking over the entire world, and if they have to slit every throat that they can to do it. That's exactly what they're going to do. And for some reason, for some reason, our politicians and our preachers are slobbering all over themselves trying to make everybody think that Islam is just like Christianity. In fact, we all worship the same God. Why don't we just get along and find out what's common between us? Yeah, it kind of angers me a little bit. You may have heard my testimony about spending a week in a town that had three Muslim mosques in it in Africa, in Kenya. And I may talk a little bit more about that on a Pastor Mike online. You'd be watching for that because I've got it in my mind. I'm going to deal with it. But the spirits that were in that town, I have, I have never felt a presence like that in my life. Territorial devils in that town because of those mosques. And I'll talk about it a little bit later. But I want you to take a look at this. And I dealt with this in a video I did called The Mystery of Mecca. You might want to go watch that. You'll get some more information about it. But here's, here's the five times a day. Muslims will stop, drop, and roll their carpet out. And they'll pray. They've got to know which way east is or where Mecca is. And they face Mecca, and they five times a day, because that's what their religion says. And if you don't do that five times a day, you're going to burn in hell forever. But if you do it five times a day, then you'll get the 72 virgins chained to a couch for all of eternity in paradise. I had an airline pilot tell me, Mike, he said, it's, it's, it's sickening. He said, I'll be flying, the commercial airline pilot, he said, I'll be flying the, the jet 30,000 feet, and he said, at, there have been flights where these Muslims get their carpet out, roll it out in the aisle of the airplane while we're going someplace and pray and hold up everybody. The flight attendants, nobody can get their beverages and their peanuts. Nobody can get anything because these people, five times a day, they've got to, they've got to face Mecca. And he said, the funny thing is, they get it wrong every time. He said, I know which way we're going. I know which way Mecca is. And he said, they get it wrong every time. But anyway, why did they have to face Mecca? Because of the Kaaba. The Kaaba is this big black cube in Mecca that their religion tells them they've got to go there at least once in their life and swirl around it seven times. Manly Hall says that that basically is the same thing as the seven planetary bodies or the seven spirits the seven gods, the seven deities. It's just pagan religion is all it is. But here's what's interesting. On one corner of the Kaaba, I didn't know this until a few years ago, there's a very special sacred item. So sacred 
that it's like the goal of those who do the little toilet swirl around Mecca to touch that object or to kiss it in some way. It's called the black stone. Here's a picture of it here. And here's something really interesting. You want to see this? This is from Wikipedia. You go check it out. Here's how they describe the black stone in Mecca at the Kaaba. The black stone is the, is the eastern, look at this word, cornerstone. Think of uh, Jesus, who's a cornerstone, of the Kaaba. Islamic tradition holds that it fell from heaven to show Adam and Eve where to build an altar. The Indian Islamic scholar Muhammad Ali, no, wait a minute, that was a boxer. Muhammad Hamadullah summed up the meaning of the black stone when he said, The Prophet has named the black stone Yamin Allah, which is the right hand of God. Do you get it? Do you get it? Here's this fallen star. And if you read the article, you'll kind of get the idea that everybody thinks that this is some meteorite, some stone that fell from the sky and landed there. And Islamic tradition, according to, I guess, the Quran or whatever, says that this star fell from heaven, fell in this exact spot, Mecca, to show Adam and Eve where to build an altar. Is that in the Bible anywhere? No, they made that up. It's interesting that they call it the cornerstone of the Kaaba. Jesus is a cornerstone. It's a replacement religion. It's what it is. Rick Warren, are you listening to me? Islam is not Christianity. It's the enemy of Christianity. Don't make friends with Islam. Try to preach the real gospel and try to bring these people out. If you love them, that's what you do. But it's the cornerstone of the Kaaba and it's the right hand of God. That, according to the Bible, is what Jesus is. The right hand of God. So here's, here's what we're going to, we're going to kind of transition into this here in a few minutes. I've got a few other scriptures to show you. What we're seeing is, is that whatever in the spiritual realm falls from heaven, Mankind has a tendency to fall after it. They fall and worship the image in the plain of Dura. They fall and worship the star, the right hand of God that fell from heaven in the Kaaba. They fall and worship the fallen image that came from Jupiter. Everything that falls from heaven, mankind is going to follow that and fall right along with it. In fact, mankind is very much complicit in this fallen religion. Isaiah 44, verse 13. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes. Marketh it out with the compass. Notice the Masonic tools of the square and the compass. Hmm. Marketh out with the compass and maketh it after the figure of a man according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house. This is building an idol, making an idol, mankind making his God. Isaiah 44, 15, two verses down. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a God and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and does what? Falleth down there too. In fact, here's the image. The axeman goes to the woods. You can read this in Jeremiah 10. He takes the axe to the tree. After about 20 or so whacks of that axe, that's pretty good, wasn't it? Wax of the axe. After 20 or so whacks of the axe, if he's really good, what happens to that tree? What's it going to do? fall. So what does the evil, wicked, satanic nature of man do? Let's take it, let's carve an image, make a totem pole out of it, or let's just carve an idol, let's put gold on it, and uh, make it look like the figure of a, of a, of a man. I'm going to use this in the singularity. Get ready. 
make it after the figure of a man or the similitude of something, and we're going to set it up, and we're going to fall before it. You already have a fallen God, that's the tree, and now you have mankind falling after the fallen God. God's pretty smart, isn't he? He's got it figured out, and he's telling us what's happening. So, what's going to happen here? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the falling away comes. I think mankind is going to build himself a God, and a fallen God, and fall right in front of it. I think things that are falling in the heavenly, heavenly in the spiritual realm, bringing about the falling of man, I think all of that is encompassed right here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. That's what I think is going to happen. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Here's another picture of it. And the Philistines took the ark of God, that's the throne, and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen. Imagine that upon his face to the earth, just like Goliath, and uh, before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again because Dagon can't do it himself. And when they arose, I'm just adding that in there, and when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his, of his hands were cut off upon the threshold, only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Here's something I, th I was looking at this one day and I'm going, you know, it happened twice. It fell and then it fell. Think of the phrase Babylon. We're going to look at this. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Twice. Why? Think of Christ. He comes how many times? Twice. So watch this. When Christ came the first time, he defeats all the powers of the enemy. I think that's Dagon fallen once. But after Christ rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and Peter and James and John and, and Paul, they all start preaching the gospel and people are becoming Christians all over the place. It seems like to me that they set up Dagon again. And that religion is still in effect today. You know what it, you want to know what it looks like? You know what Dagon was? It mentions the, uh, the head of Dagon and his hands were separated from the stump. You know what Dagon was? Dagon was half man, half fish, half sea creature, Leviathan. He's like Baphomet. He's a fusion of man and beast together, or man and Leviathan together. Leviathan is uh, the enemy of God. He's, this, he's the dragon in the seas uh, who has been uh, cut in pieces. So here we have the half man, half God, God, or the half man, half beast God, and the priests who gave attendance at the temple of Dagon wore these funny hats. They had, it was like a, a fish head on top of their head, and they had this tail coming down off of it that was like the, the body of a fish. It kind of went behind them there. You know, and had the little fins and stuff like that. And, but they, you can think, they look kind of silly. They had this fish head on their head, okay? That religion was set back up after Christ's resurrection. Let me, tell, let me show you what it looks like. There it is. Dun, dun, dun. That is, Dagon has fallen. When Christ died, resurrected, Dagon's fallen. The power of the enemy fell. But here it happens again. They stand him back up. Now we have a religion that encompasses most of the earth. A religion that is trying desperately to bring all of the other religions underneath its little fish hat umbrella. And the priests and the bishops of this religion all still wear the Dagon fish head hats with the fish mouth open wide. Just like they did back in the old days. You know what? Dagon fell once. Dagon's fallen again. They worship the fallen God, people. Mm -mm -mm. Now, 
Contrast this with this. I like this. Matthew chapter 4. Because you remember when the devil had Jesus in the wilderness? Jesus had been fasting for 40 days, hadn't eaten a bite. And the devil thought, I got him weak now. Remember, don't, you ever, don't you ever forget that. The devil never goes, didn't go after Jesus at the beginning of the 40 days. Went to him at the end of it. The devil always goes after the weakness and those that are weak. So here's Jesus, not eating for 40 days. The devil's tempting him. You remember what he asked him? He said, I will... Well, look at it, Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee. He's talking about all the kingdoms of the world. If thou wilt, what? Fall down and worship me. My Savior didn't fall. He withstood the temptation. He stood against it. And he just quoted scripture. That was the power. That's what the devil hates. That's what runs him off. You just get you a can of King James Bible and open it up on the devil. He'll leave. Okay? So, here's the thing. Now, we worship the God who didn't fall. They all worship the gods that do. This is where we're headed. So, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, think of the phrase, as above, so below. Here's a picture of it. Okay? As above, so below. And we'll read that verse here in a little bit. As things in the spiritual realm fall and men worship it, so men will fall with it. And this is what I think, again, is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. This is, I'm giving you all the things I think from the Bible uh, are referenced here in this falling away. So we have Lucifer falling, we have the gods falling, we have stars falling from heaven to the earth and people worshiping them. And now we have people falling. One in particular, Judas Iscariot, who the Bible calls Jesus himself, called the son of perdition in John chapter 17. Acts chapter 1 verse 18. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. Now let me... I'll give you kind of a little few details about this, okay? Um, Judas Iscariot took the money uh, and threw it at, back at the guys at the temple, and they said, well, we can't take that money. So they purchased a field called the field of Akeldama. Judas Iscariot goes to this field. He hangs himself in a tree. He's cursed. Curses anyone hangs in a tree. He's the son of perdition hanging. There's a tarot card called the hanged man. Think about it. So he's hanging from a tree, and... What happens is, this is sort of the forensic analysis of it. After a few days of a body beginning to rot, it starts coming apart. That's what it does. Um, my brother-in-law is a embalmer and the county coroner. I've helped him pick up anyway. It starts coming apart. So he's hanging there in that tree. The branch breaks, the rope breaks or whatever, but his body has already in such a decayed condition that any kind of force is literally just going to make it come completely apart. And so whenever that rope breaks or that branch breaks, the Bible says he fell headlong so in other words, the, the fall was long enough for his body to, as he's falling, to sort of tilt forward. He falls head down, and when he hits the ground, his body is in such a decayed state that literally, I don't know how to spell that word, but that's what happened to him, all right? So Judas, the man of sin, the son of perdition, He's a prototype. He falls. Bowels gush out all the place. And that's why they called it Akeldama, the field of blood, because that literally his blood was all over the place. And what we're looking at now in the scriptures, we're looking at instances. We've already seen all the spiritual things that fell. Now we're looking at the people. 
that fell. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to get in, I want you to look at these stories and say, God, I don't want to be that. I don't want to fall from you. I don't want to be moved away from you. I don't want to stop believing and trusting you. I don't want, I don't want to stop having faith in you. God, I don't want to be part of the falling. I don't want that. This is what you think when you go through these verses. Exodus 32, verse 21. Moses said unto Aaron, What did these people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Wot, W-O-T, let me just stop right here. Give you a little vocabulary lesson. What and wist, W-I-S-T, are words related to the word wisdom and wise. In other words, we don't know. We do not wist. We have no wise knowledge of what happened to him. So I thought I'd throw that in there. We want not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, and then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this cap. Moses, I've never seen anything like that in my whole life. Why, we just threw this gold in there. We just going to boil something some gold, and lo and behold, a calf come shooting right out of the top of that thing. Can you believe that? That's what Aaron told Moses. Funniest, one of the funniest stories I've ever seen in my life in the Bible. We just, just boiling some gold, and all of a sudden this calf come flying out of there. So we thought, well, hey, that must be our God. So we worshipped it. That's what they did. Now watch this. Exodus 32, 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, think about it, Laodiceans. For Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves. See the gathering? gathered themselves together unto him, and he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there what? There fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Did you catch all that? Here's what happens. We have an image now rising up out of the fire. Think of Revelation chapter 9. Think of the angel, the king of the bottomless pit. Think of the beast coming up out of the pit. We have a beast, a calf, a beast, an image coming up out of the fire. We have everybody naked, no clothes on. Uh, uh, think about um, the shame of nakedness. Think about, here's Moses, got Ten Commandments in his hand. One of them is, don't covet your neighbor's wife. And the other one is, don't commit adultery. And they're all down there naked. It looks to me like they're breaking the very commandments that God sent Moses down with. And so what happens? The Levites gathered the priests. The Bible teaches us we're priests. The Levites gathered them. So there's a gathering here and a falling that took place. You've got to ask the question, which side are you going to be on? Are you going to be on the gathering side with the sword or the falling side. Take your pick. You choose. First Samuel chapter four, verse four. This is, I think, one of the best illustrations of Second Thessalonians two in the entire Bible. Literally, you're going to see a falling. You're going to see a man of sin revealed. This is what you're going to see. You're going to see something taken out of the way, so all this can happen. Second or First Samuel chapter four, verse four. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout. Think of, boy, think of what that could be in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Think about that, all right? So that the earth rang, and when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. Now look in verse 10. The Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent, and there was a great slaughter for their fell of Israel, 30,000 footmen. The ark of God was 
taken. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. So what do we have so far? We have a falling. We have something taken away, which is the ark of God, which represents his throne, his dominion, his rule, his mercy. His mercy seat has been taken away. Ponder it, all right? Then we look down at verse 15. Eli was 98 years old, 7 times 7 times 2, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? The messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. Verse 18, it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck break and he died. He fell. So we have the footmen of Israel falling and we have the high priest, the judge of Israel falling. There's a falling away taking place. And the ark of God, God's mercy, God's throne, his dominion, now they've been taken out of the way. Now there's a falling and then we're going to see something, we're going to see something revealed that's hidden. Um, anyway, fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck break and he died. For he was an old man and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years. When you look at John 18 verse 6, as soon as, they had, as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. What is that a reference to? The, the soldiers are coming to arrest Jesus. Definitely not followers of Jesus, being led by the man of sin himself, the son of perdition, Judas. Jesus called him the son of perdition, John 17. Judas comes with the Roman soldiers and they're saying, Who, where is this Jesus guy at? And he said, I am he. The voice of God Almighty caused these men to fall backward. Mm, 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 mm. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 19. His daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child. This child is hidden. He's in a tomb. He's in a secret place. Okay? He's going to be revealed. When? When he's born. Phineas' wife was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed. Think of a travailing woman, for her pains came upon her. Verse 20, And about the time of her death, the woman, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken because of her father-in-law and her husband and she said the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken so we have we have a shout we have the falling away we have the ark of God taken out of the way we have um, and I think that corresponds to only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way and we have the son of perdition being revealed He's being birthed here, and what is his name? His name is the glories departed. That's what Ichabod means. And I think when this falling takes place and Christ gathers his elect to him, I think, and, and God's authority, God's hindrance, God um, holding them back, I think when that is taken out of the way and that man of sin is revealed, I think the glory of God departs off of the Gentile world and I think Israel gets her blessing back. It's kind, of, it's kind of what I see here. You may have different ideas on this and so on, but this is what I see going on here. But definitely we have the falling. And again, you have to decide which part you want to be on. You want to be on the gathering side or the falling side. You want to go up like Noah? You want to go up like Elijah, like Enoch? You want to go up? Or do you want to go down? Your choice. In 1 Samuel chapter 31, we have the death of Saul. Saul had a lot of problems. 
Started out good, didn't he? And it went bad. Twice Samuel confronted him. Mouth of two witnesses. Twice Samuel confronted him about rejecting the word of the Lord. Because that's what Saul eventually did. And Samuel called him on it. We're going to see that. What happened to Saul? 1 Samuel 31, 4, Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. He committed suicide. What brought about the falling of Saul? Let's find out from the scriptures. 1 Samuel 15, 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. First Samuel sixteen fourteen. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. What happened with Saul? He stopped believing what God said. He stopped giving heed to what God said. He rejected this. What is happening? With just about every denomination, every movement, what is happening to most of what's been called Christianity all over the world? What did they start doing? They started rejecting the word of the Lord. They started attributing this old King James Bible, well, that's got mistakes in it. Nobody reads it anyway. It's archaic language. We're going to give them some fresh stuff. We're going to give them the new King James Version with the Triketra on it um, and because the new King James, James Version, we like it because it doesn't teach hell the way the King James does. We're going to give them the book. We're going to give them quantum spirituality. We're going to mix New Age doctrine in with Christian wording, and we're going to have people fall into a new paradigm. They have rejected the word of the Lord. And what is going to happen? They are being set up right now for the falling. Because that's what happens. When you reject this Bible, when you reject this book, the word of the Lord, you're going to fall. Jesus taught us that if we will hold to this book, we'll withstand the devil. We won't fall. Saul, and he turned it, Samuel said, rebellion is as witchcraft. Saul ended up turning himself over to witchcraft by going to the witch of Endor. He fell, and God took his spirit. You know why God took his spirit? Because his spirit was in his word. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. So when Saul rejected the book, he was getting rid of God's spirit out of his life. And whenever, watch this, whenever you say, well, I don't believe the King James Bible is the word of God anymore. I think, in fact, I'm, I had an experience at church that makes me feel like I'm closer to God than I ever was reading the Bible. That's what's going on right now. You see it? Watch this. I'm going to just illustrate it. Here's the Spirit of God on Saul. Saul says, I don't believe God. He did it twice. He rejected the Word of God. He got a spirit of witchcraft. Here's another one. Okay? He got a spirit of witchcraft all over him. So what did he end up doing? Going to the Witch of Endor. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So in 2 Samuel chapter 7, here we have God making a promise to David concerning his son that's going to come from his bowels that's going to build a temple. Typically, he's referring to Solomon. Anti-typically, he's referring to Jesus Christ who's going to build his temple, his house, during the 1,000-year reign. But what we find out is God specifically said it. He said he's going to give mercy forever to Solomon. But he took his mercy away from Saul. Let's read it. And when the days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build an house for my name. 
and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him. I love that. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. Now I've got a picture there of the Ark of the Covenant. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant represents the mercy of God. Right now, God has mercy. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is rich in mercy, the Bible says. And it's all represented by the blood of the Lamb of God on that mercy seat as a token of the everlasting covenant that God offers. That's good. And there are those that God calls to be his sons, and he never takes his mercy away from them, ever. He's all, He always forgives them, and he forgives them again, and he forgives them again, and he forgives them again. His mercies are new every day. He just keeps forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. Those are the ones who say, you know what? I love my Bible. I love the Word of God. I, 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 know, I, don't, I know I don't do right all the time. But boy, this book is precious to me. That's Solomon. But Saul said, yeah, hate it. Hate what God said. So God said, I'm going to take my mercy away from him. And, I, and God did. God stopped forgiving him. And Saul died full of sins, full of witchcraft. And the mercy seat of Almighty God was taken away from him, just like it was taken away from Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the children of Israel. That's what brought about the birthing of the man of sin, the son of perdition, Ichabod, the glory is departed. Do you see that? So here's the question. You've got a choice. Saul, Solomon. you got a choice. Whose side are you going to be on? All of those who all of this stuff over here is part of an an overall kingdom or spirit referred to in the Bible as Babylon. Isaiah twenty one nine and behold there cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen and he answered and said Babylon is fallen is fallen. Remember Dagon fell in twice. Babylon is fallen is fallen. And all the graven images of her gods he hath broken under the ground. Revelation 14, 8, there hath another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Twice, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Jeremiah 51, 8, Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain, if so she may be healed. Jeremiah 51, 44, And I will punish Bel in Babylon, and I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he hath swallowed up. And the nations shall not flow together any more unto him, yea, the wall of Babylon shall, what? Fall. Jeremiah 51, 49, As Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. It's Babylon and that spirit that's causing all the churches to fall. And they're going to fall with her. God says, come out of her and be ye separate, saith the Lord, that you be not, don't be partakers of her sins so that you won't be partakers of her judgment. God is going to have Babylon fall. He specifically mentioned the walls of Babylon that fell. Can you think of a story somewhere in the Bible where walls fell? Joshua chapter 6, verse 20. So the people shouted, I love it. When the priest blew with the trumpets, there's trumpets and shouting here, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city. Every man straight before him and they took this. <laughs> Look at this. You see it? The shouting and the trumpets and the people go up while Babylon falls down to the ground. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 13, Therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach, ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. Let's talk about this for a minute. Let's say like a dam or a dike built to hold back water. And there's a weakness in that dam or that dike. 
And a lot of times, see, in this part of the country, we're right next to the Mississippi River, which is prone to flood. So they built these huge, what they call levees, these huge walls all down the sides of the Mississippi River to keep it from flooding into cities and farmlands that are behind it. Here in Festus and Crystal City, the Corps of Engineers built a huge wall, a levee, uh, on the outskirts of town between the town and the Mississippi River because in 1993 we had a 500-year flood. and I mean, it just devastated this whole town. I re boy, I remember it well. But see, what happens is that those walls, those levees get built and over time, there's a little weakness. And there's guys that work for the government, sometimes farmers who own the land. They'll drive up and down those levees, those walls. They're looking for bulges. Because what happens is that that water will start seeping into that levee and start pushing dirt and rock out. Be like a bulge there. When they see that, they're going, uh-oh. This thing's fixing to bust. And it usually does. A, uh, an aneurysm in a person's blood vessel. You know what that is? It's a weakened area of a blood vessel and it bulges. And most of the time, you never know it. And when that aneurysm bursts, I know a young lady died in her 20s. In her 20s, in her own apartment. Aneurysm, boom, she dropped. Just like that, she's dead. You think about that. Because one of these days, the wall's going to bulge. And that's what it said. It's a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. When this takes place, it's going to happen very fast, I think. And those of you who are kind of, you're like right here in the middle. You like, you're like related to all this stuff over here. But you know you should be following that. But you're just, not, you're just not ready yet. Let me tell you, when it happens, you won't have the chance to say, okay, I'm over here now. You won't have that chance. Jeremiah 50, verse 15, Shout against her round about. She hath given her hand. Her foundations are fallen. Her walls are thrown down. For it is the vengeance of the Lord. Uh, take vengeance upon her as she hath done, do unto her. Judges 16, verse 30. I love this story. Uh, Judges 16, 30. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords. There's five lords of the Philistines, and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew at his life. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 14. The mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit. He that is abhorred of the Lord shall fall therein. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. You know this story. The wise man built his house upon the rock. What does the words of the Bible say here? What happens to the house built upon the sand? Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken, unto him, uh, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came. Think of the uh, days of Noah. And the winds blew and the beat upon the house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And what happened to it? And it fell, and great was the fall of it. You've seen these videos of uh, California and other places where these people build these houses because real estate gets scarce around Los Angeles. So people started building houses on these massive sloping hills outside of L.A. And all of a sudden, and it, they're just built upon dirt that's on the side of a mountain. And all of a sudden the rains come and the dirt weakens and there's a helicopter flying watching the house because what happens to the house? It just literally just collapses into a thousand pieces and falls down the side of the hill. Foolish man built that house. He built it upon sand. Wise man, listen, this is, wise man is Solomon. Solomon built his house upon the rock. And did Solomon have lots of rain and fierce storms in his life? For sure, he was married to a thousand women. But his house never fell. I believe in that. I believe there are people 
who have decided to build their house and their life upon the rock of this Bible. And I'm telling you, they will never fall. There are people who have built it upon sand. All of this other stuff here. And it looks good. They, boy, they build nice houses, build big churches, big, big empires, big ministries. Joel Osteen's church. Boy, it doesn't look like some of the churches I've seen in Kenya. But it's built on sand. It's going to fall. You have to decide whose side you want to be on. You're going to, you're going to stand on the rock. You're going to fall on the sand. Luke 11. Verse 17, but he, knowing the thought, said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. That is the devil's kingdom. If you study this in, in, in the other Gospels, you'll see he's talking about uh, say, if Satan's house is divided against itself, it will not stand. And so, and, and I was troubled at this, and I'm going, because I was thinking that like the CFR, Council on Formulations, and the Freemasons, and the Vatican's, and the Islam's, and all of these different uh, occult, Illuminati organizations all over the world, they all had to be on the same side. They all had to be on the same team so they could make it work. They're not. They're not. They fight one another all the time. They are not all on the same... Well, they're all on this side. But they're not on this side. But they fight one another all the time. That house is divided. That's how you know the devil's kingdom, the, the new world order. It won't stand. It's divided against itself. When Nebuchadnezzar had his dream about the fourth kingdom, look at it. The toes were part iron and part clay. You know what that automatically is? It's divided against itself. Will it stand? Daniel 2.42, And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and bar partly broken. Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. It's a house divided against itself. And when Jesus comes, it's going to fall. I love that. Hebrews 11.30, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. The Bible's telling you right here who falls and who doesn't. Those who have faith in the word of God and don't reject it, they don't fall when everything else falls. Rahab was, Rahab was a harlot. You know what that means. She was a dirty, sleazy, nasty whore who had so many men in her life. That's who she was. That doesn't mean that she doesn't want to go to heaven. She did. She wanted to live. She believed the two. Old Testament, New Testament. She believed the two witnesses. She believed what they said. And while everybody else fell, her house stood. Isn't it beautiful? God saves everybody that wants to be saved. Mm. Let's avoid falling. Job chapter 4, the words, Thy words have upholden him that was falling. Thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. Psalm 56, 13, For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not, wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? What is it that upholds our feeble knees? The word of God. That's what gives us the ability to say. We don't have it in our own flesh, do we? No way. It's the word of God that causes it. So if you reject what's holding you up and replace it for what falls, you're going to fall. You're yoked together with unbelief. And when it falls, you're falling down with it. Psalm 91, 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Psalm 116, 8. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Psalm 141, 10. Let the wicked fall into their own nets, whilst that I withal escape. Psalm 145, 14, The Lord upholdeth all that fall 
and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Proverbs 24, 16, For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Let, let me explain this one. You know, what, you know who a just man is? According to the scripture, it's not really me. The just man is Christ. And because of his death, his resurrection, you and I, if we are in Christ, we are justified and the account of sin that was against us in the books have been blotted out with Christ's blood. So that now, when the books are read, we have no sins against us. We are now just because we have been justified. And even if we fall, God helps us get up again. Though just when they fall, rise up again. The wicked, when they fall, they're not getting back up. They fall into mischief. They perpetually fall after that. Hosea 14, 9, who is wise? He shall understand these things. Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them. But the transgressors shall fall therein. 2 Peter 1.10 Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. You know what I believe? According to this, I believe in the election. I believe the elect of God never fall. I believe the elect of God are those who build upon the rock. I believe the elect of God, God never takes his mercy away from them. I believe that the elect of God never cast away the word of God or reject the word of God. It's always there. They always hold to it. They say, this is all I've got. That's the elect of God. So he said, make sure that you are the elect. And if you will make your calling and election sure, you'll know that when the falling takes place, you're not going to be there. One of the worst things that can be told to someone in a church is that, and I saw a guy on, uh, a friend of mine, a, a pastor, street preacher, say, one, two, three, pray after me. Seems to be the, uh, the way most churches do their, what they call their salvation techniques. Now pray this prayer, now you're saved. Even if you turn to witchcraft, you're still going to go to heaven. Are you sure? Are you sure? Because everything that I've seen, those who reject the word of the Lord, like Saul, they fall. They don't get back up. You have to decide. You make your calling and election sure. If you even think that you might be over here, ask God who gives all things liberally to plant you over here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24, For all flesh is as grass, and the, all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. That's our flesh. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You know what I think happens? I think people yoke their soul to their unbelieving flesh and when their flesh falls, they fall with it. That's what I think. But I don't want anything to do with this. So I'm going to let it fall and rot off. But my soul will arise. The, what was it? The Bible says, when I fall, I shall arise. Think about it. Last verse, Jude one twenty four. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling 
and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You know who that is? It's Jesus Christ, the word of God. This is the only thing that will keep you from falling. It's the only thing that will. And if you're not latched onto, hooked onto, nailed to, fastened to, built upon and grounded upon the Word of God, if you reject it, you will fall. And you cannot be presented to the glory of God faultless. But if God keeps you standing, if the Word of God, Jesus, keeps you standing, keeps you from falling, you're presented faultless before the Lord. You see, you see how it works? So again, you, you've got a choice. Stand, never reject the word of the Lord. Or just go along with, all, well, the church, you know, they're kind of going this way. I, you know, I heard that it ain't right. But, you know, I got, I, I can get some good fellowship there. I don't want to leave my church after all. I got granddad buried out there in the back. Okay, I can't leave my church. If they're falling and they have rejected the word of the Lord, I wouldn't let granddad hold me there. I think I would leave and join with the word of God. You think about it, you pray about it. All right, singularity. We're going to see the what, what could very well be, be part of what brings this falling in, to, to place, what brings it about. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. Thank you very much for always watching, always praying for us and the, the battle that we face almost daily here. You pray for us, all right? God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.